Hi, I'm Jonathan McDonald, and I'm here with Tony Gallagher, longtime columnist for Province Sports. On the eve of training camp, uh, the Vancouver Canucks will be doing camp in Whistler this year. Uh, Tony, let's start at the back with the goalies. Um, the Canucks recently parted ways with their 35-year-old goalie, Roberto Luongo, who had a cumbersome contract. In exchange, they bring in a goalie one year younger in Ryan Miller and give him a potentially cumbersome contract. It, it, are the Canucks getting what they thought they would get when they gave uh, Miller all this money? Well, I guess we're going to uh, begin to find that out. I mean, uh, they could get two Ryan Millers here. They could get the guy who started in Buffalo last year, was just, you know, a year younger and uh, played very, very well for the Sabres, as he often did, um, you know, building his career and as a, an elite goaltender. Um, in Buffalo, or he could be the guy that was traded to St. Louis and was expected to carry the Blues a good deal in the playoffs and couldn't get them out of the first round. Um, granted, they lost to a very good team, but Miller did not play particularly well. Jim Benning flew in the face of uh, that prevailing wisdom and uh, did what many thought uh, was to be the case, was overpaid Ryan Miller to bring him here when he wanted to come to the West Coast anyway because his wife works on the West Coast in the uh, in show business down in LA. He wanted to be out here. He might have come for less. Nonetheless, they've invested in this guy. They have upgraded their goaltending because while Eddie Lack, uh, I thought, did a very, very good job, um, probably um, may not have stood up entirely to uh, a full season barrage, they did upgrade. They've gone ahead and done this. We'll just see how he plays. I suspect he'll start well. The question will be, how will he go game 60 through 80 if, in fact, they're driving for a playoff spot? And that'll be the real telltale on Ryan Miller. Okay, Tony. Now, one of the key storylines going into training camp, of course, is the Sedin brothers. It was only four years ago that Henrik had 112 points to lead, lead the NHL. It seems hard to believe now that we're just a few months out of his 50-point season, which led last year's Canucks. Then his brother, of course, just two and a half years removed from a concussion that he'll always deny affected him in the long term, but you have to wonder because he's never been the same since. These guys have been very special people and very special players, unique players. What about these guys as they get older? Well, very good question. And they got four more years coming, which is absolutely terrifying uh, long term, if you think about it, if they continue to perform at last year's level. Uh, I do think that they have taken the right steps mentally to prepare themselves this season for what they have to do. And what they have to do is score. Because if they don't, no one else on this team is going to. Uh, let's be clear about that. Now finally, I think for the first time, they seem to grasp this. They've digested it over the summer. They said, we've got to score. We've got to be in the 70 point range or higher. And we have to think offensively and be the Sedins, not meld ourselves to the thinking of a coach or of the fans or of the expectations of anyone else. They have to play like the Sedins, which means throwing the puck into weird areas, making fancy plays, making one too many plays in many cases to set up the easy one. That was their trademark. Um, direct blasting or charging to the net, that's just not, not what they do. they got to stop pleasing other people and please themselves. And finally, they realize they can't just be checkers, they can't be penalty killers, they can't be doing every other thing. They must score. And if they don't, this team's hooped. Okay. Let's talk about the collective defense. So there's been a bit of addition, a bit of subtraction. They lost Jason Garrison. They brought in uh, Lucas Spiza, a young, young kid from uh, Anaheim. Uh, they kept Alex Edler, a guy who was usually a subject of trade rumors. So what about this collective defense going forward? Well, good question, Jonathan. I think uh, collectively they probably took a step back a little bit, losing Garrison, losing the big hammer of a shot. They filled in with Spiza. Corrado's another year older. They brought Weber back for the shot more. How much Weber will play, I don't really know. <clears throat> but it still has the opportunity to be infinitely better as a unit than it was last year. Let's face it, the Canucks back end last year was horrible. Uh, they were completely confused, totally disoriented almost the entire season. Whether you blame the coach, whether you blame the players or not, 
and it doesn't really matter. This team, even if you think they're overrated as a group, and many people here in this town do believe that, even if you think they're overrated, they're still capable of playing way better than they did last year, and I expect they will. So much depends on Alex Edler. He couldn't possibly, surely, could he? have as bad a year as he did last year. He wears the green jacket in the NHL for the worst minus, of course, which is the golf prize that, at the Masters. He's not going to do that again. Uh, hopefully the new coaches will be able to help him uh, get back somewhere close to that 2011 performance level whereby he was one of the best defensemen in the league. And had he continued, that would have been in future Norris Trophy discussions instead of where he is now. Um, if he doesn't get better, then things don't look as good as, as they should for this back end. But collectively, they should be better regardless of what happens. Okay, now you talked about scoring. Of course, the eternal issue with the Canucks is the second line. Mm -hmm. And in the off season, they got rid of Ryan Kessler, long-time, very successful Canuck. Um, they got back a guy in Nick Bonino who has not won a Selkie trophy like Ryan Kessler and yet there's going to be a lot of pressure. Do you see this second line scoring some goals? I think it's really going to have trouble. Uh, much will depend on how well the Sedins play. If they have chemistry with Verbata, uh, then you have maybe, let's just say, perhaps Burroughs playing with Benino and uh, say Zach Cassian on the right wing, which I think is probably their optimal makeup uh, on a second line, assuming Cassian plays at the level he did uh, the way he finished last season, and Burroughs can regain something of the form that made Alex Burroughs the name he is in this town. Um, the pressure's on Bonino, really. Uh, he's not going to put up the numbers, the point numbers he did last year. He got 20 points on the power play last year uh, as a left-handed shot playing with Getzlaff and Perry, two right-handed shots. Well, um, he's, for one thing, he's not going to be on the first unit of this year's power play because the Sedins and Verbata and whoever's on the first unit are going to be on that. They've already said that Benino is going to kind of anchor the second unit. Second unit's not going to get out that much. His power play point production is going to fall. The question is, how does he play five on five with whomever they decide he plays with? Uh, he has a chance to be uh, fairly functional at that level. And uh, if he has maybe a 40-point season, I think that that would have to be a, a great success. They are going to have to get offense from the third and fourth lines. They say they want to play four lines. They're going to have to get something from that third line, which is going to have the likes of Hansen, Higgins. Uh, obviously, Lin and Vey is going to... They're going to try and play him at that third line center because he's the only other right-handed... the only right-handed center on the roster. He's going to have to take those crucial face-offs. Problem with Vey is he's very small. And I don't know how he's going to stand up to the big centerman in the Western Conference. I mean, he's going to be looking up at Getzlaff, looking up at Thornton, looking up at Taves every time they go on the road because that's the matchup that the visitors uh, are going to have to face. That's the one the home teams are going to seek. And uh, he is going to face the possibility of wearing down as the season goes on. Okay, well, Tony, thanks for joining me today. Folks, of course, you can follow all the training camp coverage uh, at provincesports.com on Twitter, at Province Sports. Thanks very much, Tony. My pleasure.